Well, it's great to see you guys this morning, and uh, I have a hard time saying no. I, I will admit that. And uh, now Peter contacted me a long time ago, I, I don't know, it was April or maybe even earlier, about preaching on this date. But about a month ago, I realized that there is a small struggling church two miles from here on Carl Strait Path called Faith Evangelical Free Church that needed a pastor today, but their service is at 10.45 in the morning, and yours is around 12 noon. So I thought, I could probably do them both. And so I had, uh, originally, I was thinking I could probably do the same message in both, and then Peter had this idea, kick off the brand new series. And I'm like, oh boy. So I woke up this morning, and I said, what did you do? You were preaching two separate messages, 30 minutes apart. You know, and you have to get your head together and, you know, plan what you're doing here. But the Lord gave me a verse as soon as I woke up in the morning. It's Micah chapter 3, verse 8. And here's what it says. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord, with justice and with might. And so that was my inspirational verse to be able to do two churches, two different sermons within a two-hour framework. And I thought, okay, we'll be able to do it. We're going to do fine. And so with that in mind, I am anticipating God's going to do some great stuff today as we seek to answer some questions. What is it exactly that Jesus did or did not say? And to realize that you are probably a lot like me in the sense you get distracted when you're in church. Now, I, I, I'm sure a few of you are pondering, I wonder where we'll have lunch when the church service is over. I mean, you can't help it. The stomach is growling. You have a 12 noon service. Of course, that's going to be happening. But what we're going to do is by an act of the Holy Spirit to be inspired to pay attention and listen for a little while, see if we can gain something. Because the truth is, life is difficult. And we need a word from the Lord to make it through this week. And so with that in mind, would you bow your heads with me and let's anticipate great things from a great God. Father, it is our privilege to worship you in song. And even that last song we sung, uh, sang together, Grace Upon Grace. Father, you are amazing that you've given us so much abundant grace. And Father, we're going to ask again for it because we're asking for the grace of the empowerment of your Holy Spirit right now that we might receive everything you have for us so that in the end... Your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ, might be exalted and that we will have the strength that we need to live our lives this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so today we kick off the brand new series, Jesus Never Said. Things Jesus Never Said. And today we're dealing with what goes around comes around. I know you guys have heard that phrase. What goes around comes around. So, on the way here, I am on my scooter riding on the LIE. Now, not the smartest thing, you know, a scooter. For those who are familiar, it's like a small motorcycle. Um, in the United States, we don't have too many. When I was in Taiwan, everyone drives a scooter. It's like the, the standard vehicle. And, but here I stand out a little bit. So I'm on my scooter. And do you ever notice when you're riding on the LIE, you see somebody, maybe one of these souped-up cars, <laughs> And they're like zooming past, and you see them weaving. And you're like, if there is a God, that person who just cut me off is going to be pulled over. But you never quite expect it. But you go a couple miles down, and there's that same car pulled over with a police car. And you're like, there is a God. And you know what you're thinking? You're thinking this very phrase. What goes around comes around. And we usually think it. For other people, not so much ourselves, but my daughter, when she was getting her license, she's driving my car, and she gets into an accident. She's fine. She was fine. But you know what? I go to the place of repair, and Geico is there, and they have a car all ready for me to uh, be uh, tr uh, use while they're fixing my car, and this is what they had for me. You can put that next picture up. They had a Dodge Challenger. Now, I could not believe this is the car that Geico set up for me. It turns out it was the last car they had. 
So I am going to be driving for the next week this, like, you know, very powerful car, muscle car. And so I, I think it was kind of cool. You know, I am a fairly conservative guy, but, you know, I am still a guy. And you're giving me this big toy with this big engine, and it is, like, super cool. So I, I come home, and I pull into the driveway. You know, it's like this really deep, throaty sounding engine. And uh, so we're going to go to lunch, and it's my wife and I and two of my kids. They're in the back seat, and we're now riding on the northern state. Now, the average speed on the northern state, maybe around 60 miles an hour that people were going, so a little bit above the speed limit. I turn to my wife, and I say, watch how fast this thing accelerates. And I step on the gas. Within 10 to 15 seconds, there is a siren behind me, and I am pulled off on the side. And the police officer comes to the door and says, do you realize how fast you were going? I said, honestly, officer, this is a, a rental car. I, I, it was just something stupid I did to, to show my family how fast this thing accelerates. And he says, you were going 92 miles an hour. Now, if you know, if you're over 20 miles an hour above the speed limit, now things get really serious. And I'm thinking, oh, boy. How many points is this going to be? You know, it turns out it would have been 11 points, 12, and you're suspended, just to give you, you know, a framework here. And he, he walks back to the police car. He comes back, and he gives me the ticket. This is what he wrote on the ticket, that the, the driver admits that he is stupid. He actually <laughs> wrote that on the ticket. My daughter, sitting in the back seat, says, Look on the bright side, Dad. You got yourself a sermon illustration here. And she's right. <laughs> but you know what? What goes around comes around. I decided to speed, and I reaped the whirlwind. I am now pulled over getting a ticket. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more of that story in a little while. But this principle, this idea, what goes around comes around, is something that most of us have grown up with. And it actually goes very deep into our culture and even in, in world history. Uh, for those of you, you know, what are the origins of this phrase? Um, well, uh, Justin Timberlake had a song, What Goes Around Comes Around. Um, it actually has some uh, roots in, in African folklore. It actually was coined as a phrase in 1974 and by uh, Eddie Stone. Most of us often make the connection of this idea of karma or our Indian religion or philosophy, and that is this, that in some previous life, I did something good, therefore I'm blessed in this life, another life, or I did something bad, and as a result, even though my life, I would like it to be good, I am suffering the repercussions of what happened in a previous life. Now, you have all these different images of when people say it and what people think it. Is there a comparison in the Bible? And in some respects, there is. 24 times the scripture says this, you will reap what you sow. You will reap what you sow. And I know that seems to be the case so often. But I want to know, because our series is, things that Jesus never said. Because in Christ, I have come to learn as a follower of Jesus that he gives us the chance of fresh starts and new beginnings. He just does this all the time. And yet I know there is this biblical principle, you will reap what you sow. So how do these things work together and, and how can we piece it all together? So Pastor Peter gave me some freedom as to what passage that I wanted to look at, and I reflected on this from several angles, but the one that I felt the Lord brought to me was a passage in the Gospel of John. So if you have a Bible, you can open it now to John chapter 9, John chapter 9, and we're going to look at the first seven verses. Now the truth be told, this uh, passage actually begins something that's going to be carried over for John 9 and 10. 
So the story goes on. We'll make some other references to it. But the immediate story is very helpful for us to understand what happens in terms of Jesus' perspective. So I come into my Bible, John Gospel, chapter 9, and I read this. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. The disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Moving to verse 6. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud and with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, wash in the pool of Siloam. This means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Now let's just call something out that we need to admit. This is the grossest of the miracles that Jesus uh, has ever performed. Spitting on mud and putting it on eyes. You know, in our day and age, sensitivity, it's kind of gross. But I'll tell you, if you found out that you were going to be a seeing person who was previously blind, you'd be more than happy to have a little saliva and mud put on your eyes because ultimately the man wanted to see. But as I go to the very beginning of this passage, here's what I observe. They're walking along the road, and they see a man who is blind from birth. That's pretty significant. You know, so there is no sense that he once could see and no longer could see. He has no idea what it is like to be a seeing person. Uh, later on, the Pharisees are going to interview his parents, and they will confirm, yeah, that's our son. And yeah, he was blind from birth. I can't tell you how he's seeing now, but I can tell you that he was blind from birth. But the disciples make a conclusion, which is one that we often make in different environments. And that is this. Okay, a bad thing happened to this man. He's blind. Was it because of his personal sin or was it because of his parents' sin? Now, that is that idea of, of karma or what goes around comes around. It, we see that very clearly. But then Jesus catches us off guard and, and catches the disciples off guard and says, neither. It's not related to this personal man's sin, and it is not related to his parents' sin. Now, that is to say that his parents never sinned. It is also not to say that that blind man never sinned. But it is to say that this is not the causality of his blindness, and, and Jesus actually surprises us. He says this is for the glory of God. And so what we see immediately is that something that everybody was saying in their own way, you reap what you sow, or in our day and generation, what goes around comes around, oh, too bad, that's the way it is, is not the way Jesus saw it. In fact, he sees it completely different. Now, if we went back in the Hebrew Scriptures, we definitely see this causality idea. We'll talk about that again in a few moments. But the prophet Jeremiah, along with other prophets, they say that a Messiah is going to come who's going to turn everything kind of upside down, give us a new way of thinking, a, a new way of perceiving. And one of the prophets who does this particularly well is Jeremiah. And Jeremiah the prophet, in chapter 31 of his prophecy, he gives these words. He says, this is Jeremiah 31, verse 29. In those days, people will no longer say, and here's the quote, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on itch. So here's the problem. This is the way it was always said. The parents messed up. The children are reaping the problems because of it. And, and by the way, do we see that in our own world in time? Absolutely. If your mom or dad was an alcoholic growing up in that household, you reap some of those problems. You may be in counseling because of that. So this statement that the parents ate sour grapes and the, and the kids' teeth are set on edge, that is a way of describing that. It's their idiom to make that description. But then we read this in verse 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, 
when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. Uh, Moving down to verse 34, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. So something new is going to happen, and it's going to happen when Messiah comes, when this new covenant is revealed that a Messiah is coming who, who washes away our sins. Well, that is great news and something that that blind man is going to be a recipient of because no matter what the parents did, this is not why this guy is blind. I am doing something fresh. I am doing something new. But this is the first principle I think it is fair to say, and the principle is this, that there are consequences for our actions. There are consequences for our actions. Now, take it right from the beginning of the Bible. Adam and Eve partake of the fruit. What happens? They're cast out of the garden. Actions, consequences. I move forward along in Scripture, and I I see a man like David, and he decides to have adultery, I mean really rape, of, of somebody's wife and even murder, and then the prophet Nathan comes and gives him judgment and description of what is going to happen. Actions, consequences. I, I see that, and I, and I know that is a reality. I just finished teaching through the book of First and Second Kings, verse by verse. This is all through. King is a good king. Good responses. King is a bad king. Bad responses. It happens, and it happens in our lives. When you're talking to your kids, and uh, you have young kids, and I see some younger kids here, The day is going to come when you're going to get a driver's license. And you know what? Let's say your parents say you want to come home, uh, you know, at midnight or 1 in the morning, and your parents say, no, you're coming home at 10. And you're like, oh, man, all the other kids come home late. Why do I have to, you know, come home so early? But you are a parent that wants to explain to your child why this is the wise thing to do. So you go online and say, let's just check out when most accidents occur amongst your peers. And you go, oh, oh, here's an article. What's this one say? Oh, it happened at 12.52 a.m. Oh, here's another one. Here's what this one say. It happened at 11.30 p.m. Oh, here's another one. When did this one say? It happened at 2.30 a.m. Well, looky, look. It seems like most people get injured late at night. And because I love you, you need to be home at 10. Ah, but the kid sees it. Why? It's because you're trying to explain to your son or daughter, our actions have consequences. So my wife, um, I met her when she was 16 here in Long Island. She uh, actually grew up in Tehran, Iran. Interesting uh, story with that, you know, but I eventually connected with her. But as I got to know her family, she was the first Christian in her family. And she had the same talk with all four of our children. Here is the talk. You know, Grandma and Grandpa? Uh-huh. Both of them are alcoholics on my side, she said. Then she said, you know, you didn't meet great-grandma and great-grandpa, but they were alcoholics too. And you know, Aunt Sally, she was an alcoholic. You know, Uncle Mark, he's an alcoholic. Um, For this reason, I want to encourage you to not drink, or if you choose to, to be very measured in how much you drink. Because in my family, alcoholism just kind of follows through. And that is something you need to be aware. And so, you know, of my kids, two of them drink, two of them don't drink. But the two that drink, they're very moderate in their drinking. And I'm like, they heard what my wife had to say. What she is doing is understanding this principle still exists. Your actions have consequences. And you need to be aware that the Bible teaches that, and we need to apply that. But here's where we break free, and here's where Jesus gives us some great and awesome news that if you come from a dysfunctional family, if you come from making bad choices yourself, this can end 
now. So here is the, the second point I'd like to give you is this. Our relationship with Christ under the new covenant changes everything. When you enter into a relationship with Jesus, everything changes. I love this verse from Ezekiel chapter 36. Here's what the prophet Ezekiel says. Verse 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. That is Ezekiel speaking of this new covenant that's coming. That you can have a fresh start and a new beginning. He can take that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and make you into a new individual. And I love this verse from, uh, this comes from uh, 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians, and it's chapter 5, and I read these words from the Apostle Paul, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The new creation has come. The old is gone. The new has come. So as a Christian, this idea of what goes around comes around can end in your life. All of us have made serious mistakes. All of us have. But you know what? In Christ, you can start afresh. So about 2010, the missions committee came to me and they said, we would like to visit uh, for you to visit one of our missionaries. So I'm thinking, sure. And you know what I'm thinking in my mind? Maybe it's the missionary we have in Italy. That'll be fun. I get to see the Vatican. Maybe it's the missionary we have. And I'm, I'm thinking all these great places where they're going to send me. But the missionary they wanted me to visit was in Mongolia. Now, Mongolia is the other side of the world. <laughs> I mean, it was like, really? He said, they said, we support them. There were good reasons why we support them but we actually don't know what they do outside of their letters. So would you go and check it out? So my wife is the ultimate adventurer. You know, when you're born in another country, she had been to 17 countries by the time she was 16. You know, so this woman was ready to go. So I said, would you like to go to Mongolia? And Michelle says, yeah, let's do it. So we go and we went on an Air China flight to Beijing. We spent a couple days in Beijing just, you know, while you're in Beijing, you want to see Beijing. You know, so we did a couple things. And just to show you what a wimp of a traveler I am, when we were in Beijing, I ate at the Sizzler, the Outback, and McDonald's. Now, I know that's like shameful, you know, for me to say that, but I'm telling you who I am. And you know what? I did go to one of the night markets, and I'm like, look at that. They have scorpions on a stick. I take out my camera to take a picture. The flash goes off. And the scorpions start moving. I jump back. I'm like, what do these people eat these things? And it turns out they fry them. And, you know, you take it out and you eat your fried scorpion, whatever. So I go to Mongolia. And by the way, in Mongolia, there are no Outbacks. There are no Sizzlers. There are no McDonald's. It's, you know, there are no chain restaurants, no Starbucks, you know, nothing. We land in Ulaanbaatar and I meet the missionary. Now, I'm impressed. They have a great ministry. And the ministry, they have planted nine churches by the time I was there. And since then, they have planted up to now 13 churches in Mongolia. Two missionaries. They're, they're amazing. Duya and Jargal are their names. They are Mongolians. So we're driving through Mongolia, and I'm getting to know them, and I'm talking to them. And Duya speaks really good English. He actually trained in it. And Jargal, not so much, but he, he makes his attempt. And so as we're driving through, I said, could you tell me your testimony, how you came to Christ? And uh, Jargal said, I was flat out drunk. I, I was complete alcoholic, um, unemployed, going nowhere. And then Duya tells her part of the story. She was an ambitious young woman. She sees that Russia has pulled out. Mongolia is now free for the first time in a long time. And she thinks, we're probably going to do business in English because that's the language of commerce. So I am going to learn English as a second language uh, and then be able to be a translator. So that's what she does. Now, the first missionaries to go to Mongolia, they were Christians teaching English. And so she knew the person who was teaching her English was a Christian, which was odd to her, but they were nice. They weren't too forward with their faith, but she had a very positive feel. 
Now, after Russia left, you know, the official religion while Russia was there was uh, not, uh, being an atheist. But, you know, Russia's gone, and now people are kind of going back to Buddhism, and, you know, just that's where they found themselves. But she is now trained as an English translator, and an American evangelist comes, and they need a translator. So they, they look up, and they find Duya is available. And so the man preaches the gospel, and Duya translates it. He gives it again, and she translates it again. After he had done this several times, she thinks to herself, I want this Jesus in my life. And she receives Christ. So she goes home that night, and she feels, I need to tell my family what happened. Now, the entire family, all eight of them, including Jargal, her drunk husband, are all living in a gur, which is a, a round tent, insulated tent. And she says, I sat them all down, and I presented to them what happened. Today, I became a Christian, and she explained what happened. And this is how she's telling the story. We're driving in the car in Mongolia, and, and Duya says, and then they all prayed to receive Christ. And I said, hold on, hold on. What I thought you just said is you presented that you became a Christian, you encouraged your family to become a Christian, and the whole family on the same night became a Christian? And she said, yeah, that's what happened. Really? I mean, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's so rare you hear a story like that. She said, absolutely. Jargle jumps into the conversation, and he says this, and I never drank again. The Lord radically saved me, and he became the engine to plant now 13 churches in Mongolia. Now, here's what gives me goosebumps about the story. That's the gospel. The gospel meaning he can change the trajectory of your life and make you brand new. You don't have to reap what you sowed in your youth and move into a, this, you know, because of your sins in the past, you're living them now. You can actually have a fresh start. Now, not everyone has the experience that Jargle had of eliminating alcohol. Some people, it's through AA. And I'm going to close today telling you a story about that. But the bottom line is you can live with this great hope that you can be like that blind man. You can be a person who people all think, oh, you reap what you sow. You're this way because your parents were losers. You're this way because you were a loser. To which Jesus says, no, I make new people out of old people. The old is gone, the new has come, the Apostle Paul says. But now I want to get to that overall principle, why God does what he does. And here's the last point. It's for his glory. This is ultimately what's happening. As we look at this passage in John, here's what we observe. Uh, Jesus says these words, and let me just go back here. He says, uh, we read, as they went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man or his parents, Jesus said, but this happened. Now, you hear this word, so that. In Greek, we call this a hina clause. A hina clause, is just, it just means so that. It's a purpose clause. But Jesus is giving the purpose of why this man went through this. And it's kind of deep and philosophical in some respects. But this man existed to bring glory to God. Because he was going to be an instrument by which God received his glory. How beautiful is that? And this is the principle for you and I. If your life has been going in the wrong direction, you know what? He can use his corrections in your life to bring glory to himself. So that when people see you, they go, praise God. Praise God. You know, my wife and I are going to be ultimately, Lord willing, moving to the Las Vegas area to a town called Henderson. And I already bought a house there. And my daughter lives in my house. And when God makes the plan straight, I'll, I'll go over there. We haven't made that choice yet. But when I look at that neighborhood, there is an auto repair store called the Rec Center. I love the name of that. It's where you bring your wreck. And I love it because my pastor growing up in Port Jefferson, he always said, I wish we called the church the rec center. And what he simply meant is there's so many wrecks in this world, including the pastor who looks himself in the mirror. 
and realize I, I'm a wreck saved by grace. And that is the beauty when you can have a congregation. And by the way, one of the dark sides of what we pastors, as we're preaching, we kind of know all your stories. And so as I'm looking around, I was like, yeah, that, that marriage is messed up. And, and you know, I got, oh, yeah, I got to pray for that kid. You know, this is the way we're doing when we're preaching. Our mind is going on two levels. We know we're a bunch of wrecks. I mean, that's what it comes down to. But God gets glory when we realize he takes wrecks like me and makes us brand new and gives us that new beginning. So do you guys ever, like, stalk Facebook at all? You know, you're like, you don't necessarily say any comments, but you like, just like to see what's going on in people's lives. So I'm, I'm perusing Facebook, and, and two weeks ago, I see this picture. And I think we have it up here. You can, there it is. So this is a baptism that's taking place in a church. Now, the guy who's posting is the guy who's standing all the way in back, but that is his son who is getting baptized. And I think this church is doing something really cool. They're allowing the family to be a part of the baptism. Now, that man, his name is John, and as soon as I saw that picture, I was taken back because John was a parishioner in my church in Illinois. Now, let me tell you a little bit about John. Struggle with alcohol, big time. Then, um, and because of that, you know, not thinking clearly, he made a lot of dumb choices. So he had a man that he was really angry at to the point that he wanted that man dead. So John was a roofer. And when I say roofer, don't think of a roof like this. Think flat roof, pouring hot tar. So he is doing a commercial building, and he's pouring hot tar. And along comes towards the building, but the man he wants dead. And he has hot tar in his presence. So he attempts to pour that hot tar onto that man he wants dead. He misses, thank God. The man, of course, hates him as much as this guy hate each other. You know, real intensity. But John, shortly after that, he realized how bad he was. He prays to receive Jesus Christ. He does not have the jargle experience of instantaneously not needing alcohol, but he immediately realizes he can't do this himself, and he joins AA. Now, in the process of joining AA, which was meeting in our church, he becomes an attender. And I had the privilege of baptizing John and seeing what God was doing in his life. Let me give you an example. Fast forward a couple years from that point. He's at a Christian gathering. And in this meeting, here comes the guy that he attempted to kill into the meeting. Except now he's a believer. And it turns out God saved the other guy too. And they embraced as brothers. Who would have thought only Jesus? Only Jesus. So when I saw this picture of John now baptizing his son, I say, forget what goes around, comes around, and celebrate that God can take a broken person like you, like me, and give us a fresh start and allow us to begin life anew. I am not saying that your choices don't have consequences. They do. That is biblical. That is common sense. But I can also tell you with joy that if some of the choices you've made have been holding you back, keep in mind, Jesus takes wrecks like you, wrecks like me, and makes us brand new. So I want to end with something that Jesus did indeed say. And that is, uh, if you could uh, put it on the screen here. I think we have it. There we are. We read this. Things Jesus said. This is part of the conversation, by the way, with the blind man. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So what happens after this man is healed on the Sabbath, I might add? The Pharisees are all up in arms. You know, what's the deal with this? Um, you shouldn't be healing on the Sabbath. And like, you missed the point. He's healed. But the man says, the blind man says, this I know. I was blind. And now I see. 
Probably the, one of the most wonderful stories of transformation in our history is the one who wrote for us the hymn, Amazing Grace, John Newton. Some of you know what John Newton did for a living. He was a slave trader. And he, he just knew his job was awful, but he did it anyway. He needed the money. <clears throat> then he, he repented, and he gives up the slave trade. But life got hard. He was poor. He needed the money again. He goes back to the slave trade. And then he realizes, I cannot do this. And it's after he was coming out of the slave trade for the second time that he wrote the song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, Save the Wretch Like Me. There's a movie that was made of William Wilberforce. He is the British parliamentarian credited for the ending of the slave trade in England. But he was a contemporary of John Newton and his friend. And a wonderful movie was made called Amazing Grace. And there was a scene in this movie. I don't know if this conversation actually took place, but I can tell you in the movie, it wrecks me every time I see it. So John Newton is now a very, very old man, and he's in a monastery. And he is sweeping the floors, mopping the floors, and he's just trying to write his account of what it was to be a slave trader. But when William Wilberforce comes to visit him, he explains, I'm writing my memoirs. I'm trying to remember every African name, every person that I hurt, and and just remember and bring them before God. But here's the phrase. John Newton looks up, at William Wilberforce and says, I am a great sinner, and my Jesus is a great Savior. Whenever I get to that point in the movie, I have to like pause it. I, I can't take it anymore. Because <laughs> that's me. That's me. That's you. We have, what was the song we sang right before the message? Grace upon grace. The reason I get wrecked at moments like that because I am a sinner. It's not despite my sin. It's because I'm a sinner. But the good news for you and I is that Jesus came to give us that chance to begin again, to give us life to the full. That is your option. That is my option. What does it require? That we entrust our lives to him. Let us pray. Father, what can we say? What? a privilege to be saved by your mercy. And yes, a church could be called the rec center because we're a bunch of wrecks. But we know that if Christ enters our life, something fresh and new can begin. And even though this principle of what goes around comes around, we've observed it to be true many times. It doesn't have to stay that way because the new covenant has arrived where we're no longer judged by what we do but by what Christ has done by dying on that cross that we might have cleanliness, that we might be clean, pure, holy before you. So Lord, it is our desire, it is our prayer that we would live our lives in this freshness, in this new hope, that we can be like Jargal, begin afresh and and start a whole new trajectory of our lives that we can be like my friend John and to be from somebody attempting murder to be from somebody baptizing his own son because you save us and make us new and we thank you for this grace which is unbelievably wonderful we give you our praise in Jesus name